bless you today in Jesus name you may be seated I want to briefly take you into a number of scriptures about baptism as our baptism service is coming up very soon we have I believe about five people that would love to celebrate with you all and that would love to declare to the spiritual world and to us as brothers and sisters that the enemy has lost all of his rights and all of his power over their life and that Christ has washed them and given them a new call in their life, a new direction within God's kingdom, a new task to be light and to carry hope everywhere they go and no longer a servant of darkness, no longer stuck and bound by the enemy but bought free by the blood, not perfect, not impressive to other people, but saved by Jesus Christ. When we get baptized, that's where it comes from in the Jewish culture, people would get baptized all the time. And when John came on the scene, people would get baptized into repentance. They would try to stop sinning because they were awakened again to the belief that Messiah was coming. And so because he's coming soon, they try to get their life in order. And then John clearly tells the people at the time that were being baptized into repentance from the law, there's going to come someone else. And when he comes, things are going to change. He's going to baptize with his spirit, he's going to baptize with fire. In other words, he's going to be the Messiah. Only the Messiah, the Jews would have known this, was promised to one day give the Spirit of God to all who would believe. In their time, only prophets had the Spirit. And no one else, sometimes we read of a king that was also a prophet and would have the Spirit of the Lord. But at large, even though you're a part of the people of God, you would not have the Holy Spirit and God would not speak with you personally daily. You did not know that you had to hear from somebody else what God spoke. They used to call it the prophet at the time. But John speaking about the Messiah's coming, the one who finally will give the Spirit of God to every child of God. He says it's going to change. This, this Jesus, this Messiah that is coming, He's going to baptize with the Spirit and with fire. He's going to begin to cleanse you from your sins. The fire is going to begin to start to burn away everything that God did not intend inside of you. Everything that every thought that is unclean, every thought that harasses you, every thought, every single thing that Christ did not purchase for you on the cross. The Lord promises to burn out of our life that we may, as the word says, be refined by fire as gold is refined in the fire. Many of you may know this, but the way gold is refined by fire, it is put in the fire, it's not easy, it's hot, it's uncomfortable, but it's put in the fire so long that all the imperfections, they actually begin to flow to the top. And then the smith begins to take away with something that looks like a comb, all of that dirt and wipes it aside and makes the fire even hotter until more imperfections come to the surface. And he is not done until he can see his own reflection in the gold. And then the refining by fire as gold is done. That's what the Lord promises. In other words, you're going to be changed from the inside out so that you look less and less like sin, less and less like a demon, and more and more like your father. He'll provide the fire, he'll provide the situations, he'll provide the difficulty that sometimes has to bring out the ugly in us. Amen? And when the ugly in us comes up, we are invited to bring it to our Lord, that he may wipe it away until one day more and more we begin to reflect Him in the presence of man and in our generation. But baptism, as we physically do it, tank of water, I'm going to dunk you all the way, just like they used to do it in the Jewish nation. What that meant, if you got baptized by somebody in the Jewish nation, that was you saying, I abandon what I used to believe and used to know. I'm going to go with what this rabbi teaches. And so people would get baptized. 
It would happen all kinds of times. But then getting baptized in Jesus' name was quite costly. Because most religious people, most people in the nation that called itself after the people of God did not like Jesus very much. And if you followed him, that meant you weren't welcome in the synagogue anymore very much. That meant you could get stoned at any time if you started to speak about that Jesus. We learned that from the story of Stephen. And all kinds of misprivileges and all kinds of second-rate citizen treatments could come to you when you would get baptized into that name, the name of Jesus. But when is it allowed? Who's it for? And what is it really about? Let me read to you Acts chapter 2, verse 36 to 39. Acts chapter 2, verse 36 to 39. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, because they did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They had to repent of their unbelief. Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now when you begin to realize what baptism was about in that culture, it becomes very simple. He's saying, you get baptized into what this Jesus teaches. You repent from your unbelief that through His name, you can actually be forgiven. You repent and you begin to be baptized in His name. You begin to believe what He taught about the Father. You begin to believe what He taught about sin. You begin to believe that He is a sacrifice sufficient for your life. What will happen? The gift of the Spirit you will receive. Say gift. A gift. A gift. If you work for it, you want a gift. You earn it. So you're allowed to ask for the Lord to give you the Spirit. You don't have to ask because God promised you a gift and every person that is willing to repent of their unbelief towards whether or not Christ is enough for them to be perfect in the eyes of Almighty God, for them to be brought into the family and the kingdom of God, and for them to have the promise that God will gift His Spirit to those that have believed on Jesus Christ. 39, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, there was a reference to Gentiles, as many as the Lord, our God will call. And let me take you to chapter 8, verse 35 to 38, talking about Philip, the very famous time where he baptizes the eunuch. Now, if you were a eunuch, you were looked down upon by the people of God like you could not believe. That was about the worst position you could be in in their culture because the Jews were awaiting the Messiah. And the Messiah cannot be born from your lineage, lineage if you cannot have children. And a eunuch having himself dedicated to serving men, no longer able to produce a child, was one of the lowest things a, a person of the kingdom of God would look at. And here we have a, a eunuch, a great example of what the people of God would regard as somebody that's kind of nothing and will never be really anybody in God's kingdom. Here Philip meets this eunuch, not a part of God's people, looked down upon by God's people. No legacy among the people of God as far as they are concerned. Let's read verse 35 to 38. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at this scripture and preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ 
is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Now here's the great promise and secret in this passage, if you will. It doesn't matter how low you feel among the people of God. It doesn't matter how looked down upon you have been. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of Almighty God, then you are allowed to follow Him and His teaching, which baptism is a simple sign of. A declaration that says, I want every demon and every worker, every spirit in hell to know that Christ has purchased me, Christ has washed me, Christ has set me free. And I want every person to know that Christ has forgiven someone like me. There's hope for anyone because Jesus did not require me to be any more or any less than I am. He has loved me, washed me, and forgiven me. If you believe with all your heart. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I want to invite you to stand with me for a moment. We're going to have a brief moment of prayer. We're going to pray for those that have expressed the desire to make that commitment to the Lord Himself and to say, Lord, I'm repenting of everything I've ever believed and I'm going to start to believe You. I'm going to believe that I have been washed by Your blood as You claim. I'm going to believe that there's no separation between the Father and me anymore because of what You have done on the cross. I'm repenting of my doubts. I'm repenting of my ways of life. I am willing to have nothing but what Christ has done and taught for someone like me. Lord, we pray for those, Lord God, who have in their heart the desire, Lord, to no longer follow the teachings of men, to no longer submit to spirits of religion and doubt, to no longer submit, Lord God, to the idea that we have to work every sin out of our life or else you will be disappointed with us, Lord God. Lord, we come to you. We need a God who promises to burn us clean with fire by his own initiative. We need a God who promises to give us his spirit that we may receive his gifting, that we may be able to build his kingdom for we have nothing in ourselves. We need a God who gives undeserved gifts. We need a God who has paid for our sins. We need a savior, Lord God, and a declaration, Lord God, will be made, Father, that we have decided to no longer give way, Lord God, to doubt, to no longer give way to other spirits, other reports, Lord God, that still call us guilty. Other reports that say it is not finished, not for you. Other reports that say there will not be any significance for you in God's kingdom. You are one of the lowest like this unit. Lord God, we pray and we repent, Lord God, of all of our doubts and we pray Lord God that we may declare in just a few weeks together Lord God in celebration that because of Christ we have been set free because of Christ the dominion of Satan has been broken because of Christ we no longer go to church for ourselves we go that we may be sent out to tell others that Messiah has come that the Spirit has been promised that fire has been promised and that God will pick up the weakest and the most broken people and change them around into a bearer of hope that all people in all nations would have hope because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for calling on to people's hearts. And I pray, Lord God, if you are calling on anyone's heart to begin to believe that your words are true, I pray, Lord God, that we may have a great celebration of baptism all together, Lord. I pray that you give them boldness, Lord God, to commit to your gospel. And I pray, Lord God, that you raise every single one of us up, Lord God, as testimonies of evangelism. You promise, Lord God, that people like us, people that used to have a foul mouth, 
people that used to love pursuing the things of the world, people that used to have only our career on our mind, Lord God, you promised that people like us would have rivers of living water flow from us, Lord God. Only you can do this miracle, and you will for all who repent and believe that because of Christ we are forgiven. Lord God, we want to worship you in Jesus' name. If you join me in this new worship song that we're bringing for the first time, God bless.
that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of Almighty God by whom all men must be saved. Lord God, give us a heart like yours, Lord God. As you, Lord God, did not despise the cross, you did not despise laying down your life for the prize that was set before you, that we would be able to receive a washing by your blood, that we would never be guilty again before your sight. Lord God, give us your heart, that it may be worth it to us, Lord God, that others may receive, Lord God, that same forgiveness if we go ahead, Lord God, and tell them and reach them with our lives, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that you speak to our hearts, that you give clarity, Lord God, in these last days for what you are asking us to walk into individually and as a church, Lord. God, give us wisdom. God, give us discernment, Lord, that we may not be found standing before you at the end of our time, having nothing, Lord God, that your spirit produced through our life, Lord God. I pray that none of us would stand alone in heaven, Lord God, but that there would be many on account of every person in this church, every person online, many, Lord God, that were brought into the kingdom because we individually decided it was worth it to go and tell people that Christ has come, that forgiveness is given out freely, and that repentance is possible for the worst of all sinners. Lord God, I pray that you give us your heart, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. I want to take you into the word that the Lord has given me for you today. But not before I share a very brief testimony with you. Some of you will already know. Some of you have probably guessed it from some of the posts. But I received a phone call this week and I was told that our bishop and the denomination have it in their heart to invest in my wife's and my calling as well as in general what the Lord is doing here in your lives in the church today. So as of this week, they have gifted us this entire property and everything that comes with it. So I just want to offer up a hand clap to the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To do everything that is in his heart with the building. Yes, we like to do things in excellence, so there's going to be a lot of fixing and a lot of updating and a lot of modernizing, but that's not really the work ahead of us. The work ahead of us is to be the light in Portland to serve sinners and to tell them that Christ came for sinners and not for people that can keep a law. Christ came to call sinners to repentance. And when sinners begin to believe that God is able to do what he promises inside of someone like them, God gets really excited. He sends his spirit and he fulfills every promise. And every person living all around them that was trying to keep the law in their own strength is put to shame as a real sinner, only good at sin, is transformed from the inside out and it's just changed without even trying and now living the way that people that were trying to keep the law so so desperately would like to live and every time they come face to face with the law they realize they can't they failed one more time in one more area you let jesus get his hands on you you acknowledge you're a sinner and you're just in need of jesus god is going to do all of the changing amen Amen. We're going to get into the Word of God. The title of today is Just Throw a Rock. Just Throw a Rock. The enemy of your soul loves to attack you, loves to attack people that are at risk of getting saved, people that get a little too close to the gospel. The enemy loves to send distractions into your life that you do not recognize. They may look like ministry opportunities. I've seen it many times. And if the enemy can keep you so distracted that what God has actually called you to become or what God has actually called you to do gets pushed a little to the background and is one of the things you do now with a little bit 
too busyness, too much busyness have come into your life, so it becomes hard to always finish what you start. It becomes hard to fully engage in the one thing you do know the Lord has witnessed in your heart about the one place the, or you do know the Lord is moving in your life. The enemy loves to attack what God seeks to accomplish in your life. And what God seeks to accomplish in your life is not very complicated. It always leads you and others closer to the cross. That's how simple you can make it. When you are wondering or something comes to mind, you ask yourself, is this taking me, I'm not saying church, is this taking me personally closer to the cross? And is it beginning to bring others closer to the cross? Or is this just keeping me busy? Is just just giving me the feeling that I'm a Christian, I'm doing something right? Or is this something God initiated in my life? The enemy loves to go undercover. The enemy loves it when he doesn't get found out. But when his purposes to rob, kill, and destroy everything that God seeks to accomplish in your life, when he can still rob all of that away, slow it down, break it down, cause confusion and have you be very busy with stuff that sounds all like God, yet there's no true spirit-filled fruit anywhere. Just busyness, just work. That's where people of God were at one point in their life as the prophet Isaiah speaking to them and it ended them up in a place where they began struggling with sin again. Many believers have been there, excited about the Lord, pursuing the Lord, following the Lord, and then they get their hands into too many things. They get so busy, they don't understand why. They're so engaged, they're so willing. Yet the power to just not be affected by sin, the power to walk in liberty, the power to walk in your joy, the power to walk without, without doubt, seems to diminish. And sin seems to now kind of build up again. And then the enemy comes in and starts to remind you and tell you, Ha! Huh, you're adding sin to sin. Who do you think you are that you even used to think that God is going to use you? Who do you think you are that you have a desire to be baptized in His name? Who You add sin to sin. Let me read it to you. Chapter 30, verse 1. Woe, woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord. Who take counsel, but not of me, and who devise plans, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. Now this was written to the people of God at a time where they were seeking to serve God through what many of you may know as the Ten Commandments. They tried to be good enough for God, hoping that then God would invade their life and do something significant. But here... The Lord rebukes them and he tells them the end result of that journey, that they may add sin to sin. In other words, they keep adding to their sin and that is what the enemy likes to have you add. He likes to bring you to that place where he is using something the Lord wrote in his word. He sounds godly, if you will. But what he is speaking to you is you are in a place where you are one of those difficult kids that God is speaking about and you are adding sin to sin. He wants you to feel condemned. He wants you to feel discouraged. He wants you to feel that there's some work to be done. And if you could get it done, then obviously you're welcome back to God. But he is speaking to the hearts of believers at many times that they are adding sin to sin. And I want you to hear the gospel today. So I'm going to take you to Hebrews chapter 8 and tell you what the Lord says about this now that Christ has come into this world, into my life, into your life. Hebrews 8, chapter, chapter 8, verse 10 to 13. For this is the covenant or the agreement that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they'll be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, know the Lord for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. 
For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and lawless deeds. I will remember no more. In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete is growing old and ready to vanish away. Church, I don't care what you struggle with. I've said it a million times. I don't mind people that struggle with sin. I mind people that start to hide it and make peace with it because they put themselves isolated away from the people of God in darkness and now are at even more of a display for the enemy to mess with them. I don't like for the enemy to mess with you. It's a good place to dwell in the light. But you can no longer add sin to sin. It is impossible for you, if you have believed that Jesus is the Son of God, for you to add sin to sin. Because God says, I do not remember any of the past sins that you bring up, that the enemy brings up. I have put them away as far as the east is from the west. I have cast them out and he promises, I will no longer remember them. You need to get this. It never becomes harder for God to forgive you. It doesn't matter how long you've struggled. It doesn't matter what you struggle with. It doesn't matter how gross or how unintentional or how horrible the sin is that has been committed to you. It never becomes harder for God to forgive you because He has decided To not remember your sins. He doesn't. When you come to him and you say, Lord, I've really, really been hurt by even my own actions. Lord, look what I've done again now. Lord, look where I'm running to. Lord, look what is in my heart. God doesn't go, wait. Didn't you come to me about that last week? And 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 one time the month before, I think it was the same day last year as well. God does not remember our sins. As far as he is concerned, it is the very first time he ever heard about it. And so when the enemy begins to speak into your life, you are adding sin to sin. It becomes harder to run to God because he may just remember all of it, just like the enemy and I do. And it may just become hard for God to forgive me. He may want me to work at it a little bit harder. See me be a little bit more faithful with the little that I do have. And maybe then I can come back to God. Not true church. The Lord tells us that he does not remember your sins as far as he cares. It's the very first time. He looks at you and he goes, you have lived a perfect life. From your birth all the way until right now. I'm going to forgive this one as well. He looks at us as if Christ is coming before him asking in prayer. He looks at us as if Christ is coming before him with a perfect life. And what you're talking about, God doesn't even see it. It makes no sense. Because you have already been washed and he does not remember the sins that you sometimes remember and that the enemy likes to remind you of and tell you you're just adding sin to sin to sin. God already sees you coming. The gospel is simply this. God does not remember your sins. The first covenant, the covenant, the agreement that the people of God had with God called the Ten Commandments or the Covenant of Moses, this was one of accusation. There has not been a man or a woman alive that ever came to God through that covenant, through that agreement and realized, wow, I'm righteous, I'm good to go with God. Not one person has ever experienced washing from their sins or being set free when they came to God through that covenant. But this new covenant that God sent His Son He is the covenant, the covenant that does not remember sins, is the covenant we need to decide to believe and to need to decide to run to the covenant that does not remember our sins. And the covenant that promises to baptize us with a fire that will clean us, that will clean the dirtiness out of us, everything we could never clean. 
Everything we ever hid deep down, He will just burn it out, bring it up, wipe it away, and you will begin to look like Him more and more. And then on top of it, He promises to give you His Spirit. He promises that you will know what is on God's mind. He promises that you will receive the heart of God. He promises that you will know what people need all around you, that words of life may come forth from your mouth because He does not remember your sins and He remembers what Christ has done. When God looks at you, when God sees you coming and you have all of this stuff with you, good or bad, God remembers what Christ has done, never what you bring along. Never forget that. God remembers what Christ has done, never what you bring along. But not for lack of trying, the enemy will always pursue and attack your peace. The enemy will always pursue and attack the rest that Christ has purchased for you and he's continually seeking to lead you into one step at a time as you get to know Him better. The enemy loves to attack what God seeks to do in your life. And I want to take you to a story in Judges chapter 9 where you're going to see this almost play out exactly like a parable. I've been praying for the Lord to begin to show you Jesus in the Old Testament and I pray that today once again your eyes will be open and your heart just breaks out in a party. Amen? Amen. Amen. Judges 9. I want you guys to learn something from this story. I want you to see Christ on every page of the Old Testament. I want you to get excited about reading the Word at home. I want you to get excited about what the Spirit has promised to show you when you open your Bible. And I want you to have some ammunition for when the enemy comes to knock on your door. We're going to look at an enemy of the people of God and we're going to look at an enemy in people's lives. We're going to look at his might. We're going to look at his strength. He's incredibly strong. And we're going to look at his track record. And we're going to see something quite terrifying that is very much in line with the enemy of our souls. Let me read to you verse 5 of chapter 9. Then he went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers, the 70 sons of Jeroboam or Gideon, on one stone. But Jotun, the younger son of Jeroboam, was left because he hid himself. Now here we have Abimelech, one of the first real stories about him. And he really became a king of death. He really became a pursuer of death, one that always seems to pursue bloodshed, one that always seemed to have the attack of people on his mind. And we see him at it again, we'll pick up in verse 44, at a different place and a different city, seeking to sow death again. 44, then Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward and stood at the entrance of the gate of the city. And the other two companies rushed upon all who were in the fields and killed them. So Abimelech fought against the city all day and he took the city and killed the people who were in it. And he demolished the city and sowed it with salt. Now when all the men of the tower of Shechem had heard that, they entered the stronghold of the temple of the god Berith. And it was told Abimelech that all the men of the tower of Shechem were gathered together. And Abimelech went up to the Mount Zemon and all of the people who were with him. And Abimelech took an axe in his hand and cut down a bow from the trees and took it and laid it on his shoulder. And then he said to the people who were with him, what you have seen me do, make haste and do as I have done. So each of the people likewise cut down his own bow and followed Abimelech, put them against the stronghold, and set the stronghold on fire above them, so that all the people of the tower of Shechem died, about a thousand men and women. So here we have a description of this king of death that is in reputation, in strength, might, and in his track record, very similar 
to what we see the enemy of our soul be described as by this world. Incredibly strong wherever he seems to go and really put his foot down, he seems to be able to do so. He seems to have quite a lot of might, so much influence in society, no one can stop him, no one can really stand against him. Earlier in the story, someone stood up and said, let me fight him, I'll stand against him, and Abimelech just walked over him like that. Many of you have had seen that with people that you believed loved the Lord. People that you believed when they spoke about God and it seemed like the enemy just ended up walking all over them. Ended up breaking down whatever they had built with their life. Ended up setting on fire the few things they were seeking to do for God and it seemed to all crumble and come down. A track record of victory, but a victory that means death for other people. That is the man we're facing right here. And here comes the report that now he's on the way to come and knock on your door. It is a guaranteed church if you have believed or consider to believe that Jesus is enough for you to be washed and to be perfect in the eyes of Almighty God. If you've even thought about it, you're tired. He will come and he will come and knock. And here in the story, the same thing begins to happen. The people hear that this kind of a king, this king of death, now has set his mind to come to them. Verse 50. Then Abimelech went to Tebez, and he had camped again to, against Tebez, and he took it. In other words, he began to come towards the people of God, and he began to take some ground. And he began to conquer some of the areas that you once thought you had victory. And now it seems that he may have some strength in your life. Now it seems that he may have some thing to say about how good you're doing and what you are allowed to do and not to do. How free you are actually allowed to move around in what God has done on your life. And then verse 51, but there was a strong tower in the city. And all the men and women, all the people in the city fled there and shut themselves in. Then they went up to the top of that tower. Proverbs 18 tells us that the name of the Lord is a strong tower for us. And here the word begins to speak about that strong tower which the people begin to flee into. And then verse 52 so Abimelech, that enemy, came as far as the tower and fought against it. And he drew near to the door of the tower to burn it with fire. Listen, church, the enemy will never back down from fighting against the strong tower in your life. He will never back down from attacking you on the grounds that you believed God had already given you victory for he will never back down from fighting against that tower. He will accuse you and tell you, I'll burn it down. He will tell you, you are adding sin to sin. I'm coming for you. There's no protection for you here. This tower is not going to be able to keep you safe. I'm knocking on a door. And I am coming for you. And I want you to learn to just throw a rock. Watch this. Verse 53. But a certain woman dropped an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. Now what does the Apostle Paul say about marriage? What does he teach us? He says it is a mystery and it speaks of Christ and the church. He says Christ is the bridegroom and you church are the bride. And since you are the bride and you have hidden yourself in a strong tower. There's going to be days that the enemy is pounding at the door and yelling at you. I'm coming for you. You've added sin to sin. I will burn this tower down in your life. This will not keep you safe. You're too weak. You're too broken. You're too guilty for this tower to keep you safe. You are adding sin to sin. Church, just throw a rock. You have been hidden 
in the cleft of the rock and you just take a little piece and you just throw it at him and it will crush his head. It will take him down. Remember what your Jesus has said. He says, I don't remember your sins. He's knocking on your door. The enemy's knocking on your door, shouting, you are adding sin to sin. You throw a rock and you say, no, my Jesus don't remember my sin. The enemy's knocking on your door and says, God is no longer with you. You've lost your call. You've lost your favor. You've lost the ability to stand in this generation. You cannot expect God to turn Portland around and make it a city of hope. Just make it by yourself. Just fight for your own survival. Just throw a rock. I love to tell my church what the Bible says. You want to know what the Bible says, church? Let's go to Genesis 3.15 because I need you to see this and I pray you'll never forget it. Genesis 3.15. Let me read it to you. God speaking. When Adam and Eve have just added their very first sin. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. You shall bruise his head and your and you shall bruise his heel. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heels. God speaking to the enemy. God speaking to your Abimelech. God speaking to Satan, the devil, the accuser of the brethren, whatever you want to call him, the enemy of your soul. God making the devil a promise and saying, yes, you're going to bruise the body of Christ. His body was bruised for what? For our transgressions. But he promises the devil right here, and he shall bruise your head. That word bruise means crush. And he shall crush your head. Church, God has given you the rock of all ages. God has hidden you in the cleft of the rock. And there's more than enough of Christ to throw at the enemy. And sometimes I love, you know this about me, I love to remind the enemy of what God has promised. God has promised that every time the enemy knocks on your door, you have the ability to just throw a little rock and crush his head. Christ's body was bruised for your transgression. But the rock of all ages bruises and crushes the head of your enemy every single time. If you're just willing to throw a little rock just like this woman, you're simply that woman in the story. You're the bride of Jesus Christ, hidden in a strong tower. But by God, throw some rocks down when the enemy knocks on your door. There's weak ones with you in that tower that don't feel they're carrying anything around. There's broken people with you that are too weak, too discouraged. But you have the rock of all ages and you can just throw it down and say, no, that's not what God has spoken. The enemy has started this game from the beginning. Didn't God say they're not allowed to eat from any trees in the garden? That's always how he, didn't God say that if you sin again, you need to run to him and somehow feel forgiven again because clearly you are not. Didn't God say he needs to quit people or else he cannot call you? Didn't God say, I need you? To repent of all your sins. Walk away from them and follow me. And if you cannot do that. How will you be a follower of Christ? The enemy always comes. To pound at that door. To take it down. But you get to respond. With what God has spoken over your life. Not guilty. No remembrance of the sin. Beloved. Washed. Cleaned. Called. Because of God. Not because of me. Church. Just. Throw a rock that the prophecy that God gave to Satan may be fulfilled to someone with a life like yours. You can be that one that just, in different translations, that stone she throws down, that millstone is described as a small stone. A millstone had two parts, a big and heavy part. You needed to be big and strong to pick that up. And then it had a, a small part on top that you just used with your hand to grind down all of the weed. And that's the stone. That is the word that is used in the original language. We don't have a good word for it in English, but it was a small stone. You could carry it with you. 
and this woman, again, signifying it's not the strong man, it is not the fighters, it was somebody that had a rock that caused the attack on that tower to completely stop in its tracks. Church, it has been prophesied. It will be the rock that crushes the head of your enemy. So every single time he knocks on your door, you have an opportunity to remind him of that prophetic word and to let him experience his head being crushed. If you would stand with me for just a minute. I don't care again, church, and I know the Lord does it. I know where I come from. I know all of the struggles I've ever had. The Lord is always looking for a man or a woman that is willing to pick up just a little rock. You don't have to be strong. That is willing to say, I only remember one scripture, but I'm going to throw it right back at the enemy. I only remember pretty much paraphrasing what God has spoken over my life. Something that whoever would believe would not perish. That's all I remember. But I'm throwing it at Satan today. Church, throw a rock and his mouth will be shot. His head will be crushed. And even the weak ones that have fled with you in that tower, they're going to see the demise of their enemy when somebody start throwing rocks. Amen? Amen. Let's pray, church. Lord God, I pray, Lord God, that you give us a rock-throwing attitude. I pray, Lord God, that you teach us, Lord God, that we don't need a very big piece of the cleft of the rock. We may remember one verse. But, Lord, when the enemy comes to pound on our door, when he comes to tell us that we're adding sin to sin, when he comes to tell us we are not ready, to be baptized. When he comes to tell us. We cannot expect you to just gift us your Holy Spirit. When he comes to tell us. That your word is not accurate. When he comes to say Lord God. That what you said was a little different. Lord God. Teach us. To just throw a rock. Teach us Lord God. To believe. Teach us Lord God. To come into your word. And to collect all kinds of rocks. We can throw Lord God. Teach us, Lord God, to protect the weak. Teach us, Lord God, to show those around us that have hidden themselves in the strong tower of our life, Lord God, that one rock takes out the enemy, that one rock will crush his skull, because my God has told our enemy from the beginning that my Christ, the rock of all ages, will crush his head. God, teach us to throw a rock that we, Lord God, may see your victory in our lives and the demise of our enemy every single time he pounds at the door. Lord God, teach us, Lord God, to be a rock-throwing people. I pray, Lord God, that we may have a song of joy, a song of victory, and a song of blessing unto your holy name that is more powerful than anything the enemy could ever throw.